we are not alone. These are supposed to be some of the most verified images of giants. People who do meditation for 60 days will lengthen their telomeres. Soon we'll get results and we'll let you know right here on Beyond Belief. Things seem to be changing in the field of ufology. It's going to be a bumpy ride. That's priceless. Isn't that amazing? Tesla wanted free energy. And look what happened to him. We have evidence to show that they're real. The real question is how and why. There were Egyptian hieroglyphs out in the outback of Australia. In Australia. What are the possibilities? Mars was inhabited, and these were built. We almost can't duplicate today. These are amazing topics. What if there was something like an Area 51 deep underwater? They were killed by some animal. Believe me. We're just getting started. I'm George Nori, and we here at Gaia are committed to revealing the truth. All right. Not long ago, the nation was shocked. Nightline ran a story, uh, did a show, and said, guess what, folks? For the last 20 years, the U.S. government has had an ongoing program of remote viewing. And as best they could in that limited amount of time, they tried to describe what remote viewing was. The nation kind of went, what? <laughs> Since then, we have been pursuing the topic. Uh, tonight may be uh, the biggest program in that regard yet. Now, Lynn Buchanan, he was a remote viewer for Project Stargate from 1984 through early 92 while part of military intelligence for the U.S. Army. He functioned as a viewer, a viewing instructor for new personnel, and a viewer profile database manager as well as other miscellaneous duties. When he retired from the Army, remote viewing was still classified. After retirement from military service in 1992, he founded the AWP to assist civilian intelligence, police, FBI, and so forth in locating missing children and founded PSI to develop solutions for intelligence-related data analysis. Prior to the facts about Project Stargate being declassified, he trained only those people who were in a position to know about that technology. Uh, Joseph McGonagall was uh, born January 10th, 1946 in Miami, Florida. He voluntarily joined the U.S. Army and was recruited by the Army uh, Security Agency for classified assignments. Uh, he too eventuated, eventuated to uh, Project Stargate. While there, he earned a Legion of Merit for providing critical intelligence reported at the highest echelons of our military and government, including such national level agencies as the Joint Chiefs of Staff, DIA, NSA, CIA, and the Secret Service, producing crucial and vital intelligence unavailable from any other source. When he retired in 1984, he maintained his association with Stargate uh, in general, the program, through his own company, Intuitive Intelligence Applications. And uh, now Paul Smith. Paul served in the Fort Meade uh, remote viewing program, Stargate, September of 83 to August of 1990, and was trained in CRV by Ingo Swan primary author of the government CRV training manual. He also served as theory instructor for new CRV trainees. Besides performing a thousand uh, plus training and operational RV sessions during his army career, a thousand. When he retired from the army, after many assignments, including Arabic linguist, intel officer for a special forces unit, intel officer with the 101st Airborne Division during the Gulf War, and Intelligence and Security Division Chief for the Military District of Washington, Paul has been accepted into a Ph.D. program in philosophy and works as a freelance RVer 
and consultant. He recently opened Remote Viewing Instructional Services, Inc., offering CRV training courses. So we have, well, I guess what we have here is three spooks. Is that about right, guys? That's, I guess you <laughs> can In say both that. senses of the word. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Uh, in order that, you know, this is not TV. So in order that we might tell you apart, if when responding to something you would say this is Lynn or Joe or Paul, it would be awfully helpful, I think, for the audience. Um, so what I'd like to let you guys do is sort of banter back and forth. And what we must begin with is explaining to the audience um, what remote viewing is. Who's good at doing that? Uh, yeah. This is Joe. I, okay. You know, I'd like to answer that if I could. Um, in my opinion, what remote what differentiates remote viewing from normal psychic functioning is that remote viewing is usually done within a controlled protocol. And that p protocol has essentially been the same and has been unchanged since uh, the original uh, research into remote viewing in 1972 at SRI. Uh, one of the, the things that dictates remote, that dictates the protocol is that remote viewing is uh, usually done blind with the uh, subject and uh, that there are specific requirements that go along with the protocol that are generally not violated. Uh, generally not violated. All three of you have gone from the military Stargate program into individual endeavors in civilian life. Have any of the three of you, in any way, significant or not, modified the protocols uh, in your civilian endeavors? Uh, this is Lynn. Let me answer that. Um, when I was in the service uh, working there as database manager, um, the Ingo Swan technique is uh, largely intuitive, and uh, in, in several spots it's not at all logical. And as a result, I've seen uh, many, many times when people will improve on it. And watching the database, each time I've seen the results go down. Um, I have uh, kept as strictly as possible to the uh, Ingo Swan technology. Now, I've added a few things that take the information and, uh, and expound upon it. But as far as the... Uh, Excuse me. As far as the basic uh, uh, technology itself, I wouldn't change it for the world. Uh, this is Paul. Um, it might be useful to, to clarify something here. Um, we're actually dealing with a couple of different approaches to remote viewing. Uh, Joe uses uh, one approach. Uh, Lynn and I use another. We learned ours uh, essentially from Ingo Swan. Uh, it's called controlled remote viewing. Uh, it used to be called coordinate remote viewing. Joe uses another uh, technique, which I, I don't know what he calls it. We tended to call it back at, in the unit uh, ERV or extended remote viewing. Uh, the goal of both approaches is to uh, essentially control the process. Uh, in fact, I, I call it uh, essentially remote viewing in a very kind of flip way of saying is is disciplined clairvoyance in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a set of protocols, as, as uh, Joe has expressed, which help uh, exclude mental noise, uh, help direct or focus your attention so that you you have a, a far better chance than you would otherwise of getting specific information that is related to the target you're trying to address. All right, I take it in Stargate. All the targets were of a military or national security uh, nature. All of the real, uh, this is Lynn, all of the real world targets and the tasked targets were. Now, we also had practice targets uh, that we used just to uh, keep up proficiency and to, um, to try out new things and uh, make sure that we didn't get rusty. Okay, kind of, kind of like uh, the military out flying, uh, out uh, following seven twenty sevens or seven forty sevens over the Atlantic. Well, uh, you could say that. Actually, <laughs> the best thing we found to ever work with was uh, pictures cut out of National Geographic magazines, uh, sealed in envelopes, and 
you describe what's what's in the picture. Describe what's at the site. So practice. All right. Sure, just well, practice. One of the things, uh, this is Joe, I, I wanted to add something so that there's no confusion in the, the listener's mind. Uh, when we were discussing, or when Paul and Lynn and I were explaining what it is we do, ERV, CRV, or whatever you want to call it, those are the, the methodologies that each one of us uses to process the information, which may, may be different. Uh, the thing I wanted to underscore is the fact that for any of those methodologies to be considered valid for remote viewing, they have to be done within the specified protocol, Absolutely. which is, is different from the methodologies that are used. Right. Uh, in fact, this is Paul again. Um, you almost might make the analogy with uh, different email programs. Uh, you can use Eudora or you can use Pegasus to download your email. Mm -hmm. um, they're just different ways of organizing the, the data, so to speak. But the email is the same, no matter, you know, the, the content is the same, no matter which particular program you use to sort it out with. All right. Well, it would be helpful for the audience to really understand what it is you can and can't do. Can you read minds? Well, <laughs> this is Paul. Um, at least in my experience, you can't do it in the, in the way that people think of it normally, like they see from a science fiction movie or something on TV. You can uh, obtain impressions, uh, emotions. Uh, you can actually obtain information, but it's not in the same sense as actually knowing what they're thinking instantaneously, instantaneously in the same words they might be thinking those thoughts in or whatever. You get the information uh, but it's not nearly as literal as uh, as people conceive it as being. Okay, uh, for example, Saddam Hussein. Could you uh, uh, target Saddam Hussein and come up with his mood, his intentions, uh, his, um, uh, in other words, what could you come up with regarding Saddam Hussein? I, I suppose uh, it would apply to anybody, but he'd be okay. a, certainly a typical target. Right, this is uh, Len. Uh, we did, in fact do exactly that to come up with plans and intentions uh, to come up with uh, background psychological information such as moods uh, logical ability uh, his his outlook on life philosophy and so forth mainly plans and intentions uh, hmm. and this can be done however like Paul says it's not a uh, it's not a thing where you, you know, put the envelope to your head and say the answer is. It's a uh, all right, but you slow said procedure. Let me interrupt. You said plans. Uh, that that would really imply a fairly direct reading of somebody's uh, uh, a mind, uh, rather than than mood. Uh, plans imply we're going to attack Kuwait, you know, on a certain date. That's right, mm -hmm. and um, it can be done, but it's it's a, a very it's an advanced level, and it's not. Uh, like Paul says, it's not something you just sit down and scribble off. Maybe I can add something here that will clarify. This is Joe. Um, one of the things that you have to understand is that in the function of remote viewing, it's not the attenuated uh, uh, protocol that, you m that might exist for, say, studying telepathy. Uh, what happens in remote viewing is you're actually opening to all of the possible delivery systems, uh, everything from clairaudience to clairsentience, clairvoyance, telepathy, presentiment, all those things are delivering bits of information. So there's an entire realm or wealth of information that's available depending on how you set up the, uh, the specific targeting mechanisms. Uh, would the three of you agree that it is the end of secrets as we have known them? Uh, Paul here. Um, I I wouldn't say it quite so precisely. Um, one of the factors. Let's let's go back to the mind reading thing. One of the things you have to recall is uh, how confusing everyone's thoughts are. Anyway, I mean, we can <laughs> we can think about one thing while we end up doing something else altogether. Uh, if we were reading Saddam Hussein's mind, uh, you know, again, not literally like that, but if we were doing that. Uh, we might pick up in the morning when he's in a bad mood and he intends to invade Kuwait tomorrow, and then uh, later on in the afternoon he's already changed his mind and decided to do it some other time, you know. So, Absolutely. so uh, it, it's never, never quite like that, that precise. Oh, boy. Uh, that that would be, it must be very difficult for the remote viewer when you're dealing with a human target, uh, which would, as you point out, change its mind. 
Well, there, there's this is Joe. There, there's inherent problems in remote viewing as well. It doesn't work all the time. So uh, <laughs> if you're operating with uh, a 60 or 70 percentile chance of actually uh, making contact with a target, then you have to also look at the fact that there are times when you're going to be wrong. Now, and, do you mean uh, to say that this is not 100% correct? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was about to it ask. Never has been. It's no, well, let's be nice. <laughs> If uh, if you can find someone who can do it 100% of the time, I will believe that the aliens are on the Earth because they're not human. <laughs> uh, well, all right. Uh, let, then what would the three of you say with regard to percentage of, uh, obviously, uh, uh, people, I suppose, could approach 50-50 on certain things. Uh, how far above that does remote viewing go? Uh, actually, let me jump in here and say, oh, this is Lynn. Uh, say that the 50-50 thing is right or wrong. If you have to select and tell a color of a card, for instance, you can say red or black, you have a 50-50 chance. What right. if you have to predict the color of a traffic light, then you have a 33% chance. Right. If you have to predict the condition of a certain spot in the desert, how many percent do you have chance? Um, the uh, good point, and and also when you when people ask for accuracy, they have noted many times that uh, different people have reported different amounts of accuracy for uh, remote view quote remote viewing, which is a is a general term actually. Uh, well, if and, you if you compare your accuracy, uh, if if let us say we take a white or a black piece of something and put it in an envelope, right. And compare your accuracy doing remote viewing compared to uh, the average Joe's guess, how do you uh, do? I am glad you ask it that way because I've been doing uh, an extended experiment on this here lately with uh, red and black cards. Ah. And right now I'm at 68.3%. Now, my guests, Lynn Buchanan, Joe McGonigal, and Paul Smith. Uh, Lynn, where are you located? Uh, I'm in uh, Maryland, about 50 miles directly south of Washington, D.C. Okay. Uh, Joe, how about you? Uh, I'm about 25 miles south of Charlottesville in Virginia. All right. And Paul? I'm a oh, half hour north of D.C. in a little town called Laurel. So all of you sort of uh, gathered not far from headquarters. That's right. We sort of had uh, uh, homes here because we... Uh, of course, we're in the project for so long, and uh, as a result, we just sort of settled. Um, let me say something else, if you don't mind, about that red-black. Yes. In the project, when I took over the database, I saw that there were um, there was some work called binary work, uh, where they were doing exactly that, and uh, it had been an experiment, and uh, the continually highest score in it uh, was a person named Joe McMonagall, uh, who even one time scored 100% on, uh, on 52 cards. And wow. I was very, very impressed. I should someday reach that. Did, did you say 100%? Uh, there was one instance in the database <laughs> where he got 100% correct. So it can be done. What? One of the, this is Joe. I'd, I'd like to say something about the accuracy. I, I, I've been working for over 13 years with the Cognitive Sciences Lab in California. That, that's the original founders of the original research in remote viewing. And, uh, we, we have collected statistics on, on dozens of remote viewers, uh, what I would call world-class remote viewers. Uh, generally speaking, uh, on an average, uh, a very good remote viewer can be expected to make contact with a uh, target site about 60 to 65 percent of the time. And out of the information they provide, uh, the, the accuracy of the information will run anywhere from 35 to 88 percent. Now, there, there are times when a good remote viewer will get 100 percent or near 100 percent quality remote viewing, but those are extremely rare. And when someone establishes their, their sort of history over a long period of time, say 10 to uh, 19 years, uh, that, that's the kind of percentages you can expect. Are those percentages increased with a team? No. 
um, from a research standpoint, uh, everything that we have in the database that we've looked at at uh, the Cognitive Sciences Lab would indicate that if you had 10 very expert remote viewers all looking at the same target as an example, and, and eight say one thing and two say another, that it's just as likely that the two will be correct and the eight won't be. All right. Um, our government, at least according to the Nightline program that ran, uh, financed uh, Stargate over 20 years with $20 million or something like that, at the end of which uh, they more or less declared it to be a failure and stopped the program. Uh, so you all three were in it. Was it a failure? Well, this is Paul. Uh, no, it was far from being a failure. Um, in fact, uh, I, back while I was still on active duty, I wrote a review of the uh, CIA report on that which I discussed many of the problems with that report. Uh, it, you know, I, it's hard to say for sure, but it almost looked like it was consciously intended to, to prove that the, uh, the program was faulty, and yet they did not consider anywhere near all of the evidence available to, to make that determination. Uh, from my own experience, and I think the other two will agree, uh, while there were times when we fell flat on our faces there, um, there were times when we were unbelievably successful as well. Uh, that kind of holds true of any of the uh, various uh, intelligence disciplines. Uh, none of them are 100%. Uh, none of them are even close to 100%. Sometimes they're very successful and sometimes they're not. So I would, I would say we were at least as successful as any of the other intelligence disciplines and sometimes perhaps more so. Well, if that's true, then uh, the declaration uh, that it was a failure was a, was an intentional piece of disinformation or otherwise known as a lie? Well, perhaps you could say it that way. You have to remember there's a lot more involved than just a bottom line as to whether it works or doesn't work. There are a lot of uh, political agendas sure, involved. There are a lot sure. of uh, personal belief systems. Uh, you know, we live in, 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 of course, in the in the scientific in a scientific paradigm that doesn't want to accept the fact that there's things that happen that they can't explain in a cause and effect relationship. So far, no one's been able to explain what it is that makes uh, remote viewing work. And so there are a lot of people who have uh, real problems with that. Yeah, most of the military people, for example. I was in the Air Force, and I can imagine what the attitude toward what you gentlemen did was, and I'm sure it was not fully positive in the ranks. Uh, what, uh, th this is Joe. Um, w one of the a very very good example of that, uh, since you brought up the military, um, there there are multi billion dollar programs which are dependent upon, um, in in essence, uh, plans or constructs that may be very vulnerable to uh, uh, psychic functioning, that may be very targetable, and uh, if if uh, some performance is uh, developed that shows a vulnerability based on psychic applications, then that can be very da very damaging to getting an approval for a multi-billion dollar plan. So that'll give you an idea of sort of the politics that might become involved. Well, at least publicly. Uh, now, they suggested they stopped the remote viewing program altogether, and Stargate indeed has been disbanded. Uh, however, do all of you agree that the government is now doing absolutely no remote viewing work whatsoever? What do you believe? This is Joe. I, I would agree with that. Um, I, I have no knowledge whatsoever of anything that the government's now doing, uh, either from a research or a collection standpoint. Um, and, and that's okay. I, I happen to think that this belongs in the private sector or belongs in the in the uh, in the public sector, where uh, many labs and many individuals can be participating in the research, uh, only I I would have to add that I think if any of that research is being done publicly, then it needs to be open to peer review and evaluation, criticism, discussion, that sort of thing. Can you, Joe, tell me whether the stock market's going to go up or down tomorrow? With about the same percentage of accuracy that I discussed earlier, yes. My, my, my. Um, I've got a fax here from a listener. Art, uh, please ask these gentlemen to speak about the episode 
they experienced when they were still active within their military unit. The episode involved eight objects entering the U.S. airspace, followed by one more type of an open airship. <laughs> this story is both amazing and amusing. <laughs> Don in Peoria, Illinois. Uh, this was uh, called uh, the the Great Christmas Attack. Uh, <laughs> uh, at one point, we uh, got a uh, uh, someone called up to DIA and had DIA call tasking to us. Um, uh, Ed Dames was the monitor on this, and uh, one by one, we remote viewed. Uh, everyone was in on this except Ed, who uh, is is very prone to lead the viewers, and uh, we were we were sort of doing it just just to to you know show what can happen. Uh, the first viewer went in. We got all of this on tape, by the way. Uh, the first viewer went in and started giving just simple. Uh, you know, there are, are live beings here. There are eight objects uh, in front of a uh, uh, an open-aired vehicle and so forth. Uh, by the last viewer, by the time of the last viewer, which was me, uh, I was describing uh, runners instead of wheels and drawing a thing, you know, drawing the sleigh runners. Uh, I was describing bells jingling and that the uh, pilot's <laughs> uniform was red with white fuzzy trim. <laughs> and uh, and uh, when I went into the session and sat down, uh, Ed told me that, uh, you know, all the viewers are supposed to get his numbers. Uh, he told me that uh, we are experiencing a an attack from over the North Pole with open-aired helicopters, which are coming down over the northern Canadian border. And what we're trying to do here is to find out their exact location and exactly what their targets are and and so forth. And uh, finally, at one point, I just uh, said something about the uh, the pilot is speaking into his radio saying, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> 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 and uh, that's about the time. Uh, I think when I said that, everyone else who was in the uh, monitor room where the TV monitor was yeah. laughed so loud that uh, you could hear them through the walls. And that's about the time that uh, Ed caught on to to the to the great Christmas attack. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, all moments um, uh, in Stargate uh, were not uh, serious, dire moments. You guys had some fun. That's right. Sure. Uh -huh. I we actually, this is the point. We actually had a lot of fun. Uh, uh, Lynn, particularly, uh, when things got a little wild, he'd, he'd put out uh, a uh, pseudo newsletter called "The Adventures of the Psy Force Five, Yeah, uh, some of which were very uh, hilarious, actually. How many of you were there in totality? Well, uh, Paul here. Um, just like any unit or any organization that's in flux with, pe flux with people moving in and out, uh, at any one time the answer would be different. Um, I think the, mil the most number of viewers we had in the organization at any one time was about seven. And then, uh, of course, with support personnel, you, you know, you had a, 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 the uh, operations officer, the branch chief, uh, secretarial, um, and uh, you know a couple of uh, monitors, analyst types. You know, so maybe roughly ten to a dozen would probably be uh, at the largest size it was. All right. Even given what you said about the politics of remote viewing, and you know religious paradigms and all the rest of it uh, being challenged in the nature of the military people. Fact is, if you guys really were able to do what you say you were able to do you would be such a national asset that it's almost impossible for me to believe that the government would just say, okay, that's it, we quit, we're not going to do it anymore, we don't care what, what Muammar Gaddafi is doing, uh, or at least care to find out this way what he's doing, or any other bad hot spot in the world, uh, we give up, goodbye. Uh, it's hard to believe. I mean, it's just not like our government. Uh, they're they're hard-bitten, they're pragmatic, uh, but you all should know that. This is Joe. I'd, I'd like to respond to that directly. Um, 
it that's true that's one that's one perception that that one might have about the government uh, however um a lot of the uh, a lot of the politics involved the managerial responsibilities for these for this program and uh, as the media has uh, you know blatantly shown since the november uh, 95 uh, exposure of the project uh, the giggle factor goes up when someone starts talking about using psychics. Sure. And nobody that has a political career wants to be caught dead standing next to any of those psychics. Uh, in fact, we had tremendous support uh, from the Senate on down and uh, in some very important positions in government. And when those people were asked to respond, in particular to the uh, Nightline program, uh, without exception, all of them responded positively, but refused to go in the air or state that publicly. All right, I'm not surprised. Um, you, all three of you have now turned to civ civilian application for uh, remote viewing. Um, are there are there are there ethical and moral limits? Or if I walk into one of your organizations with a whole bun bundle of money, and I say, "Look, I want to know what uh, Mitsubishi is going to produce in the following area." what they're doing. Will you do that for me? Uh, this is Lynn. I uh, have very definite moral and ethical limitations. There are certain things I will not teach. Uh, and basically, during the span of the course, just uh, learning the basics, there is so much to learn that uh, you don't really have time to learn all of those esoteric things anyway. Uh, now, Excuse me, Lynn. Wait, wait. Uh, there are certain <laughs> things you won't teach. Uh, oh, I do not uh, even address the subject of remote influencing and won't. Um, oh. All three of you, I take it, agree remote influencing, which means, uh, by the way, folks, the ability at a distance uh, to influence what somebody else actually does in right. other words it's, not just read their mind but influence their mind that uh, is, it is possible uh, remember it's not remote control it's remote influence i understand right uh the I, I, um go ahead Lynn. uh i want to uh make one thing very clear by the way uh keeping the database i kept all of the information on all of the projects and at no time was there ever an official tasking to our unit or done by our unit uh, involving remote influencing? Anything that was done was done by individuals on their own time. And there was some experimentation and so forth. But at no time were we ever tasked to do that. Well, would it be your view, Lynn, uh, unofficially, that remote influencing is possible? I believe so. I uh, have collected the data and tried the experiments and have uh, come to the conclusion that it's extremely possible. My God. Then, you know, I, I again, this brings me back to the military's apparent dismissal of this. Remote influencing would be of such intense interest to them uh, that it just seems impossible to me that they would not fully explore it. Well, if you were a politician funding something, would you want to get caught funding remote influencing? Uh-uh, not me. Uh, I don't think any politician does. And, of course, any time you do something in government, there's always the chance of a leak and somebody finding out. But then it again, they— political they, death. Sure, but they don't want to get caught selling missiles to Iran either. Well, yeah, uh, our and government, they did. That's right. Our government does <laughs> lots of things that it, it might not otherwise want to get caught at. And the idea of being able to remotely influ influence uh, Boris Yeltsin uh, or Saddam Hussein or any of the well, other big this guys. Is, this is Joe. I'd, I'd like to comment on that from a science standpoint. Sure. Um, I, As I said before, I've, I've been over 13 years with a cognitive sciences lab and uh, there, there are a number of labs across America um, that have been involved in remote viewing research, and many of those labs have tried some some experimentation in the remote influencing arena. There has been some some very interesting and provocative results, which are still very much up in the air. Uh, so, if you were to say absolutely we can prove remote influencing, you would have to say no, we can't. 
but if you said that there are probably that there is a high probability that it's possible, you would have to say yes, but all the research isn't in yet. That's so right. So based on that, uh, I don't know how you would actually apply it and uh, be expectant of a uh, of an ability to validate the outcome. That's right. Um, and the experimentation I've done, uh, the experimentation I know is completely full of holes and could be shot down by, uh, you know, junior woodchuck scientist. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I have uh, done the experiments to my satisfaction. I now believe that it can be done and quite easily. Uh, but as far as proof, I'm still waiting for proof myself. Um. Our president has done from time to time over the last several years things that seem utterly uncharacteristic. Have any of you had anything to do with that? <laughs> <laughs> Not I. <laughs> Other than with my vote, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, without naming anybody, uh, would one of you say, oh, yes, I definitely, in my own mind, I believe that I definitely remotely influence somebody's action? Yes. Uh, this is what I was saying. I, I have convinced myself that it does work. Uh -huh. um, However, let me again repeat that it was never official. Never official. Mm -hmm. well, one of the, This is Joe. Uh, one of the problems here, Art, is... Um, when you start talking about remote influencing of other individuals and then you bring in uh, integrity and, uh, yes. and that sort of thing, oh, yes. uh, ethics, one of the problems that you become very heavily embroiled in, especially within America and especially within research, um, is the fact that there are human use considerations that have to be taken into consideration. And, um. Who would like to try and describe the difference, if possible, between technical remote viewing, so-called, and controlled remote viewing? Um, I This is Lynn. Um, I have uh, uh, talked to many of uh, Ed Dame's students. Uh, Structure-wise, I don't think there is that much of a difference. Um, oh... Ed, of course, sticks to the um, sticks pretty closely to the Ingo Swan structure, mm -hmm. and um, uh, retains the the uh, terminology that Ingo used. All right. So, now, in other words, there is not a lot of difference. There's not a lot. Now, Ingo uh, requested that people not use his terminology, and so uh, I started using basically. Uh, slang terms that the uh, students developed. Uh, for instance, uh, analytic overlay, which is basically your imagination taking over. Uh, uh, my students called stray cats. And so uh, I took over that terminology simply because Ingo uh, put out a, a little basic letter saying, uh, please don't use my terminology. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... Uh, basically, uh, I would say as far as terminology goes, Ed's is more, Ed's is closer to the original than, than anything I teach. Um, uh, All right, may I... Structure-wise, I think they're basically the same. All right. May I ask this of all of you? Why do remote viewers generally not love each other? <laughs> well, uh, let, me, huh? let me address that. Uh, I've been watching this on the net. Wait a minute, who is this? Oh, I'm sorry, this is Lynn. Lynn, okay. I've Lynn. been watching this on the net. And uh, if you look very closely, uh, the the concept or the feeling that all remote viewers are squared off at each other is a form of sort of disinformation in itself. Okay. The... Uh, People who are squared off at each other seem to be uh, Ed squared off at Dave, Dave squared off at Ed, uh, Ed and I, uh, Ed and Joe, Ed and uh, I think soon to be Ed and Paul, uh, Ed and uh, several other people, 
and if you may notice a pattern growing there. Uh, Why do you guys, let me restructure the question, why do you guys not love Ed? <laughs> uh, <laughs> there are several reasons. One, um, uh, for one thing, uh, when he got out of service, he started uh, he started giving classified information to the public oh. um, uh, while it was still classified. Uh, he uh, is making claims that he uh, ran the project, that he started the project, that it was, you know, that he briefed the president. And, and I mean, these are laughable things. Uh, it not didn't true. happen. You say not true. Uh, not true. All and, right. And... Uh, I'd, I'd like to make a comment here as well. Uh, this is Joe. Uh, Ed has also made claims that I've worked for him and uh, that sort of thing, and those are emphatically not true statements. Yeah, he said I worked for him too, and I didn't. <laughs> All right, uh, here's a fax. Uh, Mr. McGonigal has, has said that Ed Dames, yeah. uh, Ed Dames was never a remote viewer. Uh, with the government, but was simply a person who was employed to interview prospective candidates for the government remote viewing program. Could you please ask him to comment on that? Uh, um, this, let, let me jump in yeah, there. Let Paul this. Um, this is Paul. Okay, Paul. Um, that's actually not completely correct. Uh, and it's no Paul to Joe's because they didn't overlap. Uh, Ed came in on the scene uh, long after Joe was gone. Um, Ed actually did indeed do did participate in some operational remote viewing projects. Okay. However, that wasn't his primary function. Uh, he was indeed uh, 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 more an analyst, a tasker, uh, managing training and stuff. You know, he did. He 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 was kind of a jack of all trades in that regard. He wasn't hired primarily as a remote viewer, and only under exceptional circumstances did he do that. But he did indeed indeed did do some operational remote viewing. I got that he did one, didn't he? Uh, no, the he, hostage he's, crisis. he's on for on for a number. Uh, uh, I haven't gone through the list, but uh, I'd say uh, I saw at least six or seven that he was uh, listed as a viewer on. Oh, I'd, really? I didn't have that in. Yeah. I didn't remember that from my database. Uh, uh. Th this is Joe. I'd like to comment on my comment. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's not an exact quote for what I said. All right. Um, the claim was made that. Um, by Ed uh, Dames that that he was the only person who who was qualified to train or or teach other people remote view and that he was the the most accurate remote viewer in uh, in the project and the only one who was a responsible viewer and my comment was that his primary job while he was with the unit was to to act as a monitor and interface with the the viewer in terms of uh, handling or setting up remote viewings, and that he was not a primary trainer. He may have trained uh, in the sense that he ran practice sessions and that sort of thing. And, and that's okay. The, everybody had specific jobs within the unit, um, and everyone performed as they were uh, required. And I suspect that he performed you know, righteously and did the job very, very well. Okay. Uh, where I have a problem is where he makes claims and then attributes uh, them to himself when they, in fact, don't have anything to do with him. They had something to do with someone who perhaps is not even with us anymore today. In uh, private moments, uh, you gentlemen, have have you not referred to Ed Dames as Dr. Doom? Uh, this was a nickname that was given to him in the unit before he came to us. Uh, he, was, uh, he was called Dr. Doom over there. Uh, he's been... <laughs> predicting doom, death, and destruction for years and years and years now. Uh -huh. uh, would you say that he has seen things that the rest of you have not seen? That would be a fair assumption. This is Joe. <laughs> uh, and, and that's fine. Um, one of the remarkable things about remote viewing is that when you, when you make a prediction or you make a statement about something, uh, one would hope that there would be some validity or some method by which you could prove validity or the veracity of the information, sure. uh, I could certainly choose or pick targets that are completely unverifiable and make all the claims I want, and that's okay. Um, they'll never be shown or proven one way or the other, but one would hope that if you're going to be making claims about remote viewing and its, and its capabilities, that you would be uh, 
opening yourself to being tested in some way or producing information that can be verified. All right. Well, that uh, opens up another topic and maybe a little bit in defense of Ed Dames. Um, he's been on this program and said, I'm sure you're all familiar with the amazing Randy, so-called. <laughs> yeah. um, Ed, Ed has been on this program and said, uh, as straight out, he accepts uh, Randy's challenge. There's something like a million dollars or now more sitting there waiting for somebody to prove psychic ability. Ed Dames has said, I accept. I called the amazing Randy, so-called, and asked him to come on. Uh, he sent a fax and said, okay, there's some numbers in my safe. Tell Ed to come up with these numbers. I said, that's not fair. Um, you're in control of the, uh, uh, of the numbers, and I, I don't like that. Uh, so how about coming on the program and setting up a structured test uh, with the uh, controls set up here on the program, and the amazing Randy, so-called, did not come on the program, would not come on the program. Um, do any of you feel that the amazing Randy's challenge could be uh, taken and met? Uh, uh, as it stands, uh, he's he's basically a, a magician, a, a sleight of hand and sleight of mind. Uh, and if you, if anyone does things on his terms, uh, he wins. I don't care if you were a hundred percent accurate uh, doing it on his terms. You would, you would, um, you would be subject to a magician's sleight of hand. And uh, I mean, it's a, it's a gimmick, uh, you know, that he uses for, for his own. Uh, popularity and so forth okay but if yes but if if the controls were set up uh independently uh from mr randy then he wouldn't participate that's correct <laughs> I, and so this, that's this why is, he wouldn't come on the program sure right Th this is joe I'd, I'd like to to say something about that he, he doesn't accept the current scientific controls that have been verified proven and used across uh nine to eleven labs in the world and so he's not hardly going to come on your show, Art, and, and establish a, a valid or reasonable protocol and allow someone to attempt to do the remote viewing. So I have to support Ed in, in, uh, in this because he, he really hasn't been proffered the opportunity to uh, demonstrate under a, an appropriate protocol. Well, basically, uh, the amazing Randy wrote back to me and said, I won't come on your program because I can't be in the studio with you. Well, either is Ed Dames. He's on the phone. He said, further, CNN has made yourself and myself uh, an offer to do a weekly program. It is true. CNN has approached me and has approached Randy to do a kind of point-counterpoint program. And uh, I feel it would, uh, it would water down that program, and so I don't want to come on your show. All reasons that I considered unreasonable uh, in terms of trying to set something up to, to really meet this challenge. I, I agree. Uh, we're, we're, this is Joe. Um, where, where he essentially wants to hold all the marbles and, and make all the rules, um, that's in itself uh, an invalidation of a, a truly scientific test. Uh, these things have to be open for discussion and bantering and, and argument, uh, and they are so within uh, normal science. So. He, he's actually violating the very rules that he is, says he has established. Is it possible, gentlemen, to view uh, into the future or the past? This is Paul. Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, the past is easier to do. Uh, the future is a little bit harder. Uh, but it, 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 is, it can be done. It has been done a lot and, and uh, continues to be done, I suspect. Um, Many of the training sites uh, we had at the old unit uh, involved past, uh, well, retrocognition, if you will, uh, viewing uh, events in the past. And uh, it worked very well. It, it worked as well as real time. Wow. Well, one of the problems, this is Joe, one of the problems you might, you might run into in remote viewing the future, uh, if you go out too many years, you may, you may in fact have a 100% correct remote viewing. But uh, since it it involves some something that might pertain to technology or something that we don't yet know about. Uh, there's no concept conceptualization uh, that you can put it in, no order that will make sense. So uh, you, you run into some te technical problems. Uh, 
uh, when you remote view the past, there's an even more interesting problem. Uh, history is sort of mobile, and uh, history seems to be written to support whatever the political or social requirements of the, the present are. <laughs> That's right. So you open a bucket of worms where you, you have to be willing to then take on and defend whatever you've said against the anthropologists, theologians. Uh, and the revisionists. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, Ed Dames has said, and I wish to ask you all about this, that there is, uh, in the next few years, a point past which he really cannot see. Uh, he sees some large event which he can't quite discern, which he describes as possibly a spiritual event of some sort, a massive spiritual event. Have any of you seen or sensed this? This is Paul. Um, of course, being as close as we are to the turn of the millennium, uh, just like the last time the millennium came around, there's a lot of uh, hysteria almost. And I think, they, in fact, they use the word hysteria when they talk about it historically, uh, about cataclysms and all that sort of thing. Um, I'm not saying Ed has fallen prey to that, but uh, it's certainly something to be concerned about. Uh, a lot of people are talking about end times and, uh, you know, uh, the book of Revelations uh, you know, has all kinds of things in it that people seem to be seeing happening now. I'm not going to say those things aren't going to happen, uh, but we have to be especially cautious when we deal, first of all, in the future, because uh, there, there are a lot of uh, technical problems with remote viewing in the future, uh, and second of all, dealing with uh, very emotional-laden uh, issues such as, you know, end times, cat coming cat cataclysms and things like that. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure that's an answer to the question. Uh, is there a point past which? Oh, well, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have not experienced that. All right. Um, and, and and nobody I've talked to has has had that experience that Ed is claiming. Right. Um, doesn't mean he's wrong, but uh, I myself am rather dubious. Uh, this is Lynn. I uh, uh, heard that you know by the year 2000, uh, the entire British Isles will be wiped clean of life and so forth, and uh, that sort of surprised me because I had done a session for, um, a series of sessions for a uh, company, and uh, it involved looking into the year 2005, mm -hmm. and at that time uh, it was generally life as usual in the British Isles. All right, there are some real-world things going on, uh, Lynn, that I would like to ask you and uh, the other two about. Um, frogs, indicator species, are beginning to uh, grow uh, extra uh, limbs. They're becoming deformed. Uh, they're becoming uh, multicolored in various ways. Um, all kinds of things, uh, a deformed fish. Uh, we are beginning to see changes in our ecology. Uh, do any of you that have been able to look into the future see where this ecological problem is going? Well, th this is Joe. I'd like to respond uh, with a comment, and then I'll, I'll answer it directly. Um, th these are not new phenomena. Uh, deformed frogs, fish, that sort of thing have been occurring, as well as deformed cows, chickens, snakes, that sort of thing across history. Uh, th the media's attitude towards reporting those things has changed drastically in the, in the last uh, probably 10 to 15 years as a result of the public's interest in those things. Um, in terms of what we may be seeing in the future, there's no doubt in my mind, just based on what you read in Scientific American or any other you know, valid uh, uh, research uh, reporting document, that there probably are effects from uh, the ozone depletion and uh, chemicals in the air and the toxicity that we've put into our water that we're now going to be paying dearly for for some time. Okay, but that's uh, that, that's you reading the headlines the way I do. I, I was I guess I was asking more about what might have been actually remote viewed or what you might have sensed. Uh, let me uh, jump in here if I might. Uh, it was sometime last year that uh, the prediction was made about the frogs mutating and so forth. Yes. However, uh, I have right here on the computer a copy of the New York Times from May, uh, March of 1994, talking about uh, frog mutations, and another one from the Associated Press on 95 talking about it. Well, uh, you know, 
I can remote view things that have already happened. Anybody can do that. I mean, that's easy. Uh, <laughs> All right. Uh, I can, you know, it's easy to predict things that have already happened. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you. Dr. Paul Smith with us. Served for seven years on the government's Stargate Remote Viewing Psychic Espionage Program at Fort Meade, Maryland. One of the only five Army personnel to be personally trained to coordinate remote viewing by Dr. Hal Putoff and Ingo Swan at SRI International. Now, besides being an operational remote viewer, he's the primary author of the military CRV training manual, served as theory instructor for the new CRV trainee personnel. A Desert Storm veteran, Paul retired from the Army back in 1996, founded the Remote Viewing Instructional Services, which offers full-service remote viewing training. A couple of his books include Reading the Enemy's Mind, The Essential Guide to Remote Viewing, of course, and Remote Perception is a DVD. Paul, welcome back. How are you, my friend? I am great, George. I think you probably memorized all that bio, didn't you? Not bad, huh? Yeah, you're doing great. Not bad. It's good to talk to you again, my friend. It's great talking to you, too. I've, I've, I've really needed a George Norrie fix, I have to say. Yeah, ditto. I needed a Paul Smith fix. Paul, who is left? Who's out there from the original Stargate remote viewing team? You know, that's an interesting question. And, and of course, we're all getting pretty long in the tooth. Yep. You know, um, and, of course, that, one of my main agendas is to help new folks come into the field to replace those of us who are going to be on our way out pretty soon. Um, uh, you already knew Ango Swan passed on. We've had that discussion a yes. few times. Um, but there's still some people hang on. Probably... Uh, Russell's still with us, right? So Russell is, yes, yeah. indeed. And, in fact, he's still going around doing things. It's quite amazing because he's he's older than dirt, you know. So and he's and he's blind practically, isn't he? He's an amazing guy. He really is. I mean, he he was technically legally blind, but he was still driving a motorcycle around <laughs> in California. Exactly. Nuts, I remember yeah. he told me that one night, and I couldn't believe it. And he said, "Yeah, my vision's almost gone, but I'm still on my motorcycle doing my thing." And it's crazy times. Yeah, and, you know, he enjoys doing what he's doing. He even has a documentary out now. Uh, it came out. It's, it's about him and about his part in the remote viewing program and, and other folks. He got some really uh, kind of legends to, to interviewed in the thing. Um, it's called Third Eye Spies, if people are interested. It's, uh, it's, it's a worthy effort, and uh, it gives an interesting perspective on, on his side of the program. So, Is there a difference, Paul, between intuition and remote viewing? There is a difference, but they are very closely related, uh-huh. as you can imagine. Yeah. So um, remote viewing Im- involves what a part of intuition. You know, people talk about intuition. They kind of throw that around pretty, that word around very loosely, right? And there's actually two components to intuition. Uh, in in the kind of New Age community, they think there's only one kind. And in the science community, they think there's only one kind. But they aren't the same kinds, right? So in, in science, intuition is just all these uh, subliminal, subliminal, I always have a hard time saying that, me and George Bush, right? Subliminal elements that, that come into our conscious uh, uh, consciousness, the subconscious, through our senses. And and they are sit there in the subconscious, and then suddenly when you need an insight, they may pop up into your mind. And the story I tell is somebody's walking down the street, and they aren't paying attention, but their subconscious picks up on this shadow in, the, in an alley up ahead that looks kind of sinister. They don't notice it consciously, but their subconscious does. And they get this really weird feeling saying, I don't feel comfortable here. And then they walk across the street instead of keeping going where they're going. They don't know why they did that, but it's because their, their subconscious intuition was telling them there, there might be a danger looking in that shadow, right? So that's, that is a version of intuition that science can, can get behind. They really like that because it has a physical explanation, right? There's another half to intuition, which is the ESP half, and science doesn't believe in that. Right? They don't believe that exists, and yet there are intuitive instances in our lives where we have no physical input, and yet we still make the right decision without knowing why. Were you born with uh, this remote viewing intuitive ability? Yes, I was. You know something even more marvelous than that? What's that? You were, too. Yes, I was. I I would agree with that. And you know what? I have a feeling almost everybody has been. 
They, that is absolutely true. You know, people you hear people say, "No, you got to be a gift to be. You have to have a gift to be psychic. You have to be gifted, right?" And, and they're and and they they push that around because I think they kind of want to feel like they're special because they've got the gift, right? The fact is. When I tell people, yes, you do have to be a, have a gift to be a psychic or to be psychic or to become a remote viewer. You do have to have a gift, but it's a gift everybody has. Yep, absolutely. Now, why are some people better, like you, than others? Well, um, you know, like it, with any complex human skill, you're going to have some on one end of the bell curve that don't do very well at all. And you'll have some on the other end of the bell curve who just blow the doors off of everything. Most people are going to be in the middle, right? And remote viewing is not any different than any of the rest of them. Um, so people say you have to have a talent. There, there's, of course, an element of truth to that. But part of the problem is, or part of what you need to do is you have to be, well, there's, there's ingredients to this. This is your recipe for being good at remote viewing. You have to learn the correct principles you have to be motivated and committed to work on them, and you have to practice. And if yep. you put those three things together, you will become a good remote viewer. Now, somebody may be really, really good, but you can be a good remote viewer even if you're not one of those talented few. Well, that's true. Now, of the several that you had in the government's program, you put off Ingo and a few others. How good were you folks, in your you know, opinion? It's in my opinion. Well, first of all, think about what the, what the very bottom line is. Bottom line is, according to science, nobody should be able to do this at all, right? So, if you can do it even once, and you prove that there's no way you could have done it unless you were being psychic, for want of a better word, then that already is a miracle, right? In the remote viewing program, and with plenty of people since. We have successfully done it many more times than just once. Now, can I put a measure on it? It's a little hard to do because sure. we're dealing with a you know a, a phenomenon that we don't fully understand. But you had but, a lot of hits, didn't you? But we had a huge number of hits. We had a lot of misses. I, I don't want anybody out there to think that it's perfect. It isn't. That we had a lot of misses, but we had a lot of hits when we shouldn't have had any hits. Now, right. see that 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 is the significant statement of the whole night because when people say remote viewing they say well you know the odds are you're going to hit this you're going to have no mm -hmm. what, what you hit was a high percent of things that shouldn't have happened that's right and and in you know not universally but in many of these instances where we had a hit we produced very great detail that totally matched the target so much so that there is absolutely no way we could have guessed it or we could have, there's no way we could have cheated because that was by the nature of the project not possible to do right so it had to be there's only one explanation for it and and we did it over and over and over again isn't it isn't it accurate to say paul that remote viewing could also be called perception yes in fact it's interesting ingo swan who we've mentioned uh, maybe i should just briefly tell folks who he was. Okay, yeah, you might as well. Yeah, and, and he, uh, yeah, Ingo was a, um, he had started having uh, unusual experiences as a child, what we would describe as out-of-body experiences. And after having spent three years in the Army and come back, and he's working for the UN, and then he became an artist in New York, uh, he got into the circles in New York where people were doing actual laboratory experiments with parapsychology, or ESP. He started doing those experiments, and he at one point said, you know, I have an idea how this could be done better, and he came up with what we now call remote viewing. And so he was the guy who originated remote viewing, brought it into the world. We, we call him the father of remote viewing. Maybe he's now the grandfather. I don't know. But yeah. he's the father of remote viewing, and, um, and he's, he's really just was a remarkable, remarkable guy. So, um, and you know what? Now I forgot what your question was. I was too busy telling you about Ingo. Well, we were, we were talking about remote viewing the per se and the perception oh, of... perception, that's of, it. Now, the reason I brought Ingo up was because he, he called... He's the one that actually named it remote viewing. But he said it was uh. about perception. And interestingly, because 
over the years, he and the people he worked with were frequent guests of the, of the Senate and the and, and Congress of the the intelligence committees and these organizations and you know on our leadership. Were um, they closed or open doored meetings? Do you know? You, I think usually they were closed. Yeah, because that's what I thought. Talking about stuff that was uh, relatively classified, okay. but um, and they got more classified over time, right? But uh, he he said if you went in and talked about ESP then they would just throw you out. He said, we realize we're really just talking about perception. It's a different kind of perception or a different channel of perception, but it's still a perception. So we'd go in and we'd brief these guys and we'd say, they say, well, what is this? Are you talking about being psychic? And, and we'd say, no, no, it's about perception. And they'd say, oh, perception. Oh, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I love it. You know, he was a great admirer of my late aunt, Dr. Shafika Karegula. He was. I was going to bring bring that up, but I thought maybe that you'd like to do that. He, I mean, you know, he really admired her. Uh, and she devoted her entire practice, as you know, Paul, to covering telepathy and ESP. And she was dabbling in remote viewing. Mm -hmm. I don't know how the two of them got together in terms of, you know, the research. I, I never got that answer because I didn't know about Ingo at that time. Yeah, and, and I and I can't tell you that. I have to say though, because of you, I recently acquired a book she wrote. Breakthrough to Creativity, that one? Yes. And yeah. I haven't a chance to read it yet, but I'm looking forward to that. I'm gonna find out a whole lot more about her, I think, than I know right now. Yeah. I mean it was just she was a psychiatrist who decided I'm gonna devote my practice to telepathy and ESP and she moved to Beverly Hills, California, and she passed away tragically. But mm -hmm. she was uh, on the cutting edge of all of this. I mean, she was, you know, she was one of the scientific researchers before there were scientific researchers. Well, you know, and it's those pioneers that we owe so much to. That's right. Tell me about the movie, The Men Who Stare at Goats. Oh, <laughs> I found it quite amusing. <laughs> I was about you, wasn't it? Well, sorta, sorta. It was sort of. I mean, it had bits and pieces of of a lot of the the uh, characters and personalities in the remote viewing world. Um, I wouldn't say that any one figure had much to do with me. There was one guy in there who kind of looked like me. Um, he was a guy that was in the office. I can't remember his name, but but in the movie, he's the guy that gets uh, gets married, right? And I was the only one in the unit to get married while I was serving there. So That's and he looked kind of like me. He had the same kind of hair and the glasses. So maybe he was me. Not very romantic. I'd much rather have been uh, George Clooney, but but he wasn't me. So now Ed Dames was in the movie Suspect Zero. He was. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting. A movie of him was in the movie. Aha. Uh -huh. It was uh, interesting. They had him on. Was on, that the one Ben Kingsley was in? It was. Ben Kingsley, Aaron Eckert, uh, Carrie Moss, yeah. Okay. It was a pretty good movie. It was. I found it interesting. It was very dark. And of course, any serial killer movie well, is Doctor, dark. Well, Doctor Doom is dark sometimes. Oh, okay. That's you know. true. Yeah. The, the thing about that, if people want to watch that movie, I recommend them getting the DVD version or at least finding the one that's got the bonus features on it because there's an interview with Russell Targ on that, and we just talked about Russell. Um I got to do a, uh, a outbound or remote viewing session with the director, with Elias Marriage, the guy who directed the movie. Mm -hmm. He came to Austin, and Hal Putoff and I, uh, he wanted to see remote viewing demonstrated. And so um, I did an interview for him, and then he said, okay, now you're going to demonstrate remote viewing? I said, no, I'm not going to do it. And he looked real disappointed because he spent money to come out, you know, and do all this. I said, no, I'm not going to do it. You are. <laughs> he goes, What? I can't do this stuff, although he used a, a more pungent word, shall yeah, we say. Beep. <laughs> yeah. And he said, I can't do this stuff. I said, Sure you can. I'll we'll, we'll walk you through it. Hal and I'll I'll tell you how to do it. And then uh you'll sit down, how will how will act as your monitor and we we and I had a, a, a young lady there who's a friend of the family, we will go to a target that neither one of you knows what it is. You will home in on where we are and you will successfully describe this target, perceive and describe this target. And he was very doubtful about it. But you know what? It's exactly what happened. You know, we, we the, the way it works is you go to the target as the outbound team, and they, the viewer has no idea where you've gone. Right. 
and then he tries to perceive where you are. You become a beacon. You direct. You draw his attention there. He tries to perceive where you are, and then when you get done, then you come back and pick him up, and you drive him out to the actual target, and they uh, get to you know see it firsthand what it was that they were seeing through remote viewing earlier. And we're driving down the highway. I'm not going to tell you what the target is. People, you know, if you want to watch watch the bonus features for that DVD, then you can see what happened. But well, you've already seen it, so it's just, yep. whoever is yep. listening in, right? So we're driving down the highway, and if you if you were paying attention way up in the distance, you could actually see the target. And uh, and he's sitting there, and we're having this conversation, kind of a deep philosophical con- conversation about remote viewing. And I had I told the camera guy, sit up in the front seat and keep your camera on him without him knowing it, right? And so we're driving down the road, and I didn't say anything, nobody said anything, and all of a sudden, he looks up and he says, that's the target! He recognized it from his remote viewing. It was just awesome. So, you, you know, folks got to watch that, because it's really fun to, to watch him do that. We got into, the government got into the program because of the Soviet Union. We must have heard something what what did we hear through spies or something that they had a program going? Yeah, we had. There, there's another interesting little twist to this that I found out a while back that I don't think you've heard. So I'll tell you about it in a second. Okay. So, so the reason we got into the remote viewing program was that our spies were finding, discovering that the Soviets were spending literally hundreds of millions of dollars. On not rubles, which were worth a whole lot, right? Less and on money they probably didn't even have, right? Yeah, well, they got it from somebody, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> they could have used for something else, but they were spending hundreds of millions of dollars on what we would call paranormal research. And, and think of this in perspective. So, the, the gov- our government gets criticized because criticized they spent twenty or twenty-five million dollars over eighteen years. That's actually longer than that, over twenty-three years on the program, right? The Russians are paying ten times that amount of money on their program. Okay, so so the CIA found out they were doing this stuff and they didn't understand it. Why are they doing that? They didn't even know what it was. Well, no, not really. Some of the stuff they did, but but some of the stuff they didn't. They didn't even know if it worked. You know, mm-hmm. but they they knew the Russians didn't spend that kind of money on something that they didn't think they were going to get some value out of. That's one thing about uh, about communists is they're pretty pragmatic about stuff. Exactly. Right? So um, they were, were puzzled about it, and they heard Hal Putoff, who was the scientist that was behind this, and Ingo Swan, who I've already mentioned, they had gotten together and just done kind of a one-off experiment that had turned out successful, and the CIA heard about that and said, Putoff was working at SRI International, it was Stanford Research Institute, but now SRI International is a big government think tank. It's not government, it's private, but they do work for the government, and it's got totally totally classified. I mean, you can do all kinds of classified research there. They did nuclear weapons research and secure comms research and that kind of thing. Well, Putoff was there and and just inf- happened to do this experiment with, with Swan. Perfect for the CIA. Perfect. Because they could come and give a contract to them to work on it and it could stay inside the classification envelope away from the Russians' prying eyes, right? So that's how we got into it. Paul's uh, websites are linked up at coasttocoastam.com. His books, The Essential Guide to Remote Viewing, Reading the Enemy's Mind, a DVD called Remote Perception as well. Paul, what is this little tidbit that you have here for us? So we just got done talking about um, how the U.S. got into it because they discovered the Russians were into it, Mm -hmm. really heavy, into remote viewing and, and, and researching paranormal kinds of phenomena, right? Well, it turns out that the Russians were into it because of the U.S. <laughs> oh. What came first, the chicken or the egg, right? It was kind of like that. Now, the question is whether it really was the U.S. or not, but, but there was a story in one of the French uh, magazines or newspapers, Le Monde or something like that, I don't remember, about an ESP experiment that done on the USS Nautilus. Now, the Nautilus, of course, was the first, the world's first nuclear-powered submarine, and it had gone under the pole and the, the North Pole and all that, and it, th- that whole thing freaked the Russians out because they didn't have anything that could do that. All they had was diesel subs, which could only stay underwater for a certain short period of time. Well, a nuclear sub could stay under for, like, a long time, and that, that was really spooky for them. But 
it was even worse when the French published this thing about the experiment. Allegedly, someone had set it up to where they had a, a sender and a receiver, whatever, somebody functioning is that on land, and then used ESP to communicate with the submarine. Now, I haven't been able to determine if that really happened. The story really got published, whether or not the the actual experiment happened or not, or if it was just some, you know, a fevered imagination of some journalist or whatever. But But it didn't really matter for the outcome of that, because... The Russians believed that it happened, and so that seems to have been, if not the the impetus, at least one of the major reasons why they actually started researching paranormal stuff. So interesting. Yeah. So if we actually did that, was... we caused the Russians to do it, which caused us to do it. <laughs> and why did the program? And I think it did stop. Um, it well, it did. I'm I'm convinced that at least pro, the the version I was in stopped. Um, or they would have used you guys. Well, yes. Um, there, there's more to it than that. Uh, people don't understand. They think of the government as being this monolithic thing that, that is just kind of goes like this massive, I don't know, whale through through the, the world and, and, and trumps on everything, right? They think they don't realize that the government is actually made up of a lot of people, a lot of whom have different opinions than other people there, right? So the problem the remote viewing program ran into was that there was a group of folks who were supporters of it, and there were a group of folks who were detractors of it. And it went from being highly in favor to being almost dead uh, numerous times over its 23-year existence. But the unfortunate thing towards the end was that... uh, the people who were supporters of it either passed away or retired, and it left the people who were the detractors, the ones who didn't like it, left holding the reins of power in the in DOD and the intelligence community. And so when it came up, this, what happened was Congress decided – it was at the time it was at the Defense Intelligence Agency. Okay. And Congress wanted it given to the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency – but at the time, the director of the CIA, uh, John Deutsch, I think was his first name, uh, Deutsch was his last name, um, he was very much uh, biased against remote viewing. He was known Why? to have kicked people out of his office. To woo-woo for him? It. He was, uh, I want to say, a nuclear physicist. He, he had some kind of uh, Scientist, yeah. energy background or nuclear research background. He was a hardcore physicalist scientist. And for those sorts, remote viewing just can't possibly be real. Right. And he couldn't believe that the government was really doing it. And when it when it came to be his responsibility, there's no way he was going to do it. And the outcome was that the program was, was canceled the very day it was transferred to the CIA. So there's this real irony. It's called the CIA's Stargate program. That's what everybody calls it, right? But the one thing that's true about that is, is well, the... The true thing about it was it was called Stargate. The thing that isn't true is that the CIA ran it. The CIA never ran the program. They canceled it as soon as they got their hands on it. And just because people in the positions to make those decisions in the CIA didn't want to have anything to do with remote viewing. It's very unfortunate. Well, let me say this. It was an unfortunate chapter in the government's involvement in remote viewing. It was actually a blessing to the rest of the world because... They declassified it, and they essentially allowed those of us who were in the program to tell the rest of the world about it. So, so it's, it's actually a good thing that happened in the long run. Now, under remote viewing, if you're under the influence of, like, ayahuasca or some stimulants or something like that, does it enhance it or not? Yes. <laughs> It does. So, so the question. Well, no, the yes, it's, it does or it does not. That's that's what the yes is to it. Oh, okay. Both of them is, are kind of the right answer, and I'll explain why. So, people are always wondering how do you know uh, psychoactive substances and stimulants and things? How do they affect remote viewing? Uh, there's this idea that that um, they must help in some way because there's kind of a belief that that, for example, was um, Oh, I'm blank of the word. LSD, those kind of things. Uh, um, 
hallucinogens, right? It's marshmallows. Like, oh, yeah. Mar- mar- <laughs> mushrooms, not marshmallows. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe marshmallows, too. Who well, knows? I guess it depends on what you put on the marshmallows, right. doesn't it? So, anyway, um, there's a kind of a, a thought that they, they must enhance extrasensory perception because you get stories from folks where they have these really marvelous things happen to them, right? Uh, particularly with ayahuasca, I mean, people... That's that's both a horrendous and amazing experience, from what I understand, right? Um, but they report all these kinds of visions and stuff, and so the thinking is, well, it must enhance your ESP. It has to. But but let's talk about something. I'm going to start off with the benign stuff and then work up. So first okay. off, caffeine. You know, drinking coffee or it's or a stimulant. It's a stimulant. It's a stimulant. It's a central nervous system stimulant. It seems to help remote viewing. Because of course it, it it helps it helps our thought processes. Well documented that caffeine actually enhances mental functioning because it is this central nervous system stimulant. Now, alcohol, you know, liquor or, or beer, or wine, actually may not be helpful because it's a central nervous system depressant. Right now, it may serve a function if if you have a little bit. It may serve a function to relax you and allow you to function a little bit better in that respect. But in terms of helping you think better, it doesn't. Right, marijuana, same issue. It, it I had one of my sons had had gotten in marijuana for a while, and he swore that he was a much smarter guy when he was on marijuana than when he wasn't. The rest of us could attest that he wasn't <laughs> a much smarter guy. Yeah. <laughs> so so anyway. Um, that is also it kind of a, in a way it kind of slows down your your ESP functioning because it slows down your whole mental processing. Now, here we come to the more interesting stuff: the hallucinogens, the psychogenic, uh, the psychedelics like LSD or or the DMT that's in ayahuasca and that kind of thing. That stuff may indeed enhance ESP functioning. Okay, it may, but here's the problem. It also enhances the noise. That's part of the pro- part of the overall problem. So in remote viewing, uh, when people ask me, well, "Well, what do you teach when you teach somebody to remote view?" and I say, "Well, getting into the details, you know, it's, it's the devils are it, devils in the details. It, it's a pretty complicated thing when you talk in the details. But if you want to just talk in general, okay, in general, what do I teach them? I teach them to recognize what is signal, what is accurate." And what is noise? Because we have all this noise in our heads all the time anyway. The speculations, the guessing, the memories, the, you know, the what the heck is this all about? You know, all of that kind of stuff is going on in our heads all the time. This mental chatter, we have, we always have that, no matter what we're doing. Okay? And, and that gets in the way of the signal when you're remote viewing. And so you have to learn how to tell the difference between the signal and the noise. And when you Everything that they you learn in a remote viewing class, it boils down to that. It just is a really hard thing to do, is sort those two things out. So you have to, you know, there's a lot to it, but it, the the concept is fundamentally simple, right? But here's the problem with with the hallucinogens is that in the process, perhaps, of enhancing your your ESP, it also dramatically increases the noise. And so in the process of getting better lock on the signal with your ESP, you also end up clouding it or, or clogging up the system, if you will, with the noise. Mm-hmm. So the end result is it doesn't seem to help, at least as, you know, when I say it doesn't seem to help, there's some, some experiments that worked a little bit better. There's other experiments that didn't work very well at all. And so the net result is, generally speaking, it doesn't seem to help. The, the ESP process, being psychic, whatever you want to call it. Give us a mini course, Paul, in how to tune oneself to become a remote viewer. What do you do? Whoa. Okay. So <laughs> the first thing people will tell you, you got to clear your mind. Well, that's not quite true. And how do you do that? Yeah, that's the problem is almost nobody can actually clear their mind of thoughts, right? And in fact, the people who say they can, which are, which are long-term Meditators. Some of them say they've successfully cleared their mind. They can't prove they've cleared their mind. We don't know if they really did or not, right? So clear your mind. That's actually not what what you do. What you do is you learn to let go of the guessing. You learn to let go of the speculations. You learn to let go of the memories that keep suggesting themselves. Let those go. It's a very Zen-like thing. I've I've been 
I've been comparing remote viewing and Zen for like almost 30 years now, right, in my instruction. And, 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 and remote viewing has so much in common with, with Zen, where in Zen, it's all about the process. It's not about the, the end result. And remote viewing, if you get so focused on being successful, coming up with the right result in the end, you'll actually undermine your own success. Remote viewing, you have to learn to just let go of it and let it happen. And you'll gradually learn to know what the noise feels like and what the part that isn't the noise, that is the actual signal, feels like. And you'll gradually learn to just let go of the noise. I almost put myself to sleep thinking about this, you know. Letting <laughs> go of the noise. And and then allowing the signal to come through, like you're just a conduit, allowing that signal to come through, and you put it down on a piece of paper. It's important to objectify it, we call it. It's important to put it on paper and verbalize it, because that's the way you kind of siphon out the information and get it, and get it down to where it can be used. If you're not in the military, Paul, or if you don't have some kind of corporate agenda, what is remote viewing used for for an individual? What can they use it for? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And, in fact, just if I can mention my recent book, The Essential Guide to Remote Viewing, I have yeah. a whole chapter in there on how on how uh, remote viewing has been applied and is currently being applied. But I'll give you a real quick synopsis. So, obviously, we use it for intelligence collection. And there are, gov- there are businesses who do competitive intelligence, and, and, and they're interested in, in, in this kind of thing occasionally. We, I've done... My, me and my little group have done, uh, you know, tr- found a corporate mall, mole. Actually, I identified a corporate mole in a company. It was trying stealing intellectual property for another company. We were able to identify a case where, in fact, uh, one uh, multinational had actually stolen uh, a patented process from another company. We were able to actually establish that that happened. Um, and, and so there's still intelligence kinds of things that are being done out there in the corporate world. Um, we did a little bit of it even for the government back during the global war on terror, uh, the, the, the really hot days of it. Um, they, we were approached, other people were approached to by you know, government agents who wanted to try remote viewing, but there wasn't a program in the government anymore. So they come out and, and hire us or get us to do a pro bono, which is most of us did it for pro bono uh, for them. Anyway, so that's your standard uses, but it is currently being used in investing. Um, there's a process called associative remote viewing, which probably don't have time to go into right now, but, but is a way of being able to predict uh, the outcome of a future event. For example, a sporting event, uh, is Team A or Team B going to win? Uh, using associative remote viewing, you can get that correct between 70 and 80 percent of the time a day or two before the event actually happens. And then, of course, you can, if you're in Vegas anyway, you can bet on the contest and see you know, and, and, and hopefully make some money if you get it right. So, but, but they use it in, in, you know, in cryptocurrency. They use it predicting whether cryptocurrency is going up or down or the stock's going to go up or down or whatever. And people are making, actually making money at this, sometimes substantial amounts of money um, using remote viewing for that. And then it's used in archaeology. Uh, uh, I've even participated in a couple of projects where we were trying to find cave art in, in France, for example. And um, and so on. You know, it's used in all in a lot of the things you think of. But um, is it used primarily for current things or future things? It's used for both. Of course, in the investing element, it's, it's future because that's what you want to know. Right. right. You want to know if 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 uh, I don't know uh, oh, what's a GameStop. You want to know if GameStop is going to close up or down to whether you're going to sell or buy. Right. Um, but it's oftentimes used present time or even past time. If there's something that you need to know about the past, like a, a, an event or something, or uh, the origins of some archaeological treasure or something, you know. So uh, they, uh, it, it is often used in that. Um, can you can you go up to let's say the year three thousand fifty? Can you go that far? Um, in principle, you could, but it's you would you would not know if you got it right or not. <laughs> No, you won't be around for that. Yeah. But it could be fascinating to see what you see. You know, uh, Stephen Schwartz, who I think you've had on. Yep, yep, we know Steve. Yeah, he, um, 
he he has this thing he called the 2050 project where he got remote viewers uh and actually not even just not even remote viewers he ta- he taught a workshop and then all the people who attended the workshop whether they really were remote viewers or not he gave them a little protocol they could follow and then he proceeded to talk them through remote viewing uh, or whatever you want to call that process uh it's at the very least similar to remote viewing what uh, the world would be like in 2050 and I think he may have published something about that. I don't recall. He's now working on 2065. <laughs> so, so there is somebody, at least one person, who is seriously putting that into application to see what they come up with. And, and I'm not going to probably be around in 2050, although I might. I was born in 1952, so you never know. 1998, yeah, I might be. It'll be interesting to see how close he gets, and uh, you know, that'll, that'll be intriguing. Paul, there was a time Ingo Swan had uh, invited you to do a remote viewing project with him that would examine the dark side of the moon. Did you do that project? You have a good memory, George. Yes, I do. I take great notes. <laughs> yes, I did. Yes. In fact, I worked with him on two different lunar projects. So right now, I can't remember which one is which, but... Yeah, that was a kind of a mind-blowing thing. Was that the impetus for his book, Penetration, or had he done that before? Well, Penetration came out in 1999, and some of this lunar work we did before that. I right now don't recall if any of what we came up with ended up in Penetration or if he had a different agenda with the book. You know, I'd have to go back and reread it. It's been 20 years since I read it. Um, some people read it religiously. I've read it and I haven't. Did you, <laughs> did you find anything on the far side? Yes. Uh, well, <clears throat> let's just say I seem to have found something on the far side. I, I'm always cautious about what I accept as being totally true in remote viewing because it isn't a 100% thing. Uh, every remote viewer, even the very best ones, get some of their stuff wrong. Right. It's, it's the nature of the thing. So... <clears throat> particularly when I, it, we haven't been able to verify it yet, uh, you know, I kind of say the jury's still out on whether what I got was real or what, whatever, or whether it was, uh, you know, my imagination. It's hard to say. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll add a caveat to that in a second. Uh, you'll see. But yeah, my perceptions were that there was an artificial structure, uh, mostly underground, on the far side of the moon. And that, in fact, there were conveyances coming and going, and there were life forms of some kind. I, I say people, but, you know, that's kind of a relative term in, in dealing with a subject matter like this, um, in, in this in this area. And uh, so and this is, of course, on the first side of the moon. Now, I, to tell people up front, I didn't know that's what the target was. When you're, when you're uh, doing remote viewing properly, you, the remote viewer, can't know consciously what the target is so you never get told what it is to start with right exactly just give a a, a a number that's linked to it that doesn't convey any information so i was blind to it i didn't know i was remote viewing the moon i just did what inga wanted me to do now and when it turned out later that was the moon yeah but i mean uh, in penetration i think he talked about structures and some kind of anomalies and things like that did you see any of that uh, well, yeah, anomalies in, in structures, uh, as I said, though, is more sub sub Well, it wouldn't be subterranean, would it? Because that would be on the Earth. Well, that's underneath. Yeah, yeah. submudian. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, there were artificial uh, structural elements there that I've that I seem to have perceived. Oh, that's now, fascinating. Here, here's the other shoe here, and this is this is why I don't totally dismiss this of his imagination, is because. There were two other people working on this, Ingo Swan and another viewer uh, who I never met. I don't know who that person is. But when it was all over, Ingo gave me copies of his report. and uh, of, the, of the other person's report? The other person's report, too, and of Ingo's, so of the work they did. Now, I have to think Ingo was probably working what we call front-loaded. He must have realized it was the moon because he was also running the project. Right. But I think he was blind to where on the moon they were doing it. I don't I don't know, but I was fully blind because I I know because I know I didn't know anything. So um, when when I got those reports, I was able to compare them and realize that Ingo and I and to some degree this other guy had actually reported very similar things. You know, not everything reported was the same, but there was a core element of data there 
that we both reported. Ingo had also an underground thing. So my perception was it was kind of an underground cavern, and there was this um, shaft that was connecting to the surface of the moon, and there were things essentially flying in and out of there, right, the vehicles of some kind. Uh, Ingo's session, which was done totally independently of mine, I never knew what he had done until we were done, Ingo's session reported essentially the same thing. He even sketched this underground thing with a shaft coming out of it, you know, kind of exit tunnel in a way, you know. And, and then he, there were some uh, some other figures and shapes around on the surface that he sketched that I have it had almost identically on mine. So he, maybe we were we had a case of what what we know as telepathic overlay, where remote viewers read the other other viewer's mind without actually picking up the target, right? But but I was I'm not normally vulnerable to that and. So the fact that we had very similar kind of uh, concurring results suggests that maybe there is some reality to that, and, but we won't know till we actually go there and look. So, When a remote viewer, Paul, is wrong, why are they wrong? Is it uh, imagination? What, what clouds that? Yeah, well, it can be imagination. Um, Particularly, there's a, a real popular thing to do today is remote view anomaly targets. I call them anomaly targets, like UFO events or yeah. or cryptozoology, you know, the, the uh, Bigfoot or whatever, right? And far too many people do it intentionally. So they know that their target is Bigfoot or they know that their target is is the Rendlesham Forest event or whatever, right? And uh, and so they start off knowing that. Then, then everything that their brain can generate or concoct will be right there in their heads, too. And so a lot of that will end up being uh, imagination. That's why a remote viewer, you really want as a remote viewer to be blind to the target, because then your brain doesn't have that inclination so much, right? But it can still happen. Another thing, though, is that um, oftentimes it's the thing we call analytical overlay. Overlay, it's a component of the noise. It's where your analytic par- analytical part of your mind picks up on a little piece of the target that's coming in, and then does some extrapolation. So, for example, if the target's the, the Eiffel Tower, you, the viewer, are blind to the target, but you get these impressions of crisscrossing steel elements, right? Your left brain picks up on the crisscrossing steel girders, whatever, and then extrapolates that into a bridge that you saw the, in the past summer when you were traveling or whatever. The target is not a bridge. It's the Eiffel Tower. But you can see how the mind, the analytical mind, said crisscrossing elements. Oh, I know what that is. It's a bridge, right? It's wrong, but it's based on real data. So that's another way that remote viewers uh, can get it wrong. Remote viewers and other perceivers, percipients, right, uh, do kind of get their senses mixed up in a in an environment like that. So it, it's I, let's say it's not unusual, but I don't know how common it is. How would you get them mixed up? Well, if you think about how the senses generally work, and I'm not an expert on this. I, I, in my uh, graduate program at University of Texas, I did take some classes on human perception, not because I needed them in my program, because I was trying to understand it from, from a remote viewing perspective, right? And, and there's this thing called synesthesia that isn't even tied into ESP at all, uh, but does emerge in some ESP con context, like in remote viewing, occasionally. Um, In the regular form of synesthesia, they're not totally clear on how it works, but somehow the sensory pathways get mixed up. So you might uh, have a color in front of your eyes, but you taste it, right? Your eyes pick up the color, but you have a response in your taste buds. You have a taste or a flavor for that color. You might hear a a tone, a sound, or or a musical note, and you have a a taste of it, or it may cause your your skin to tingle in a in a strange way, right? In the sense mm-hmm. of your skin or whatever. That's synesthesia, and they're studying it. It's kind of a fascinating phenomenon, but they don't know exactly how it works. When it, whenever somebody finds out you're psychic, they'll they assume that you're going to do one of two things: you're going to predict the future, or you're going to find something that's missing. And ironically, those are the two hardest things for any psychic to do. And and there's various reasons for that. We talked about that on your shows in the past and i think we i don't know if we have time to do that now but yeah go ahead got a few seconds okay so trying to find something that's missing is is tricky because um remote viewing which is what i do is a descriptive methodology it is it isn't a a analytical methodology so what i mean by that is so she needs a psychic though i think 
Well, yeah, I'd say psychic, not a remote viewer. You could try a psychic, but I don't know if a psychic would help. It's, it, I wouldn't pay somebody a lot of money to get that no, kind of support. No, no, not at all. But if somebody wants to volunteer uh, to help you out, maybe you never know. You might find somebody who could do it. But it's, it's a tough thing to do and get it right, I have to say that. Are you still using a little dowsing every once in a while? And if you are, tell us about what, the, what it is. Yeah, you know, I normally dowsing is, of course, it's it's kind of the inverse of remote viewing. In remote viewing, you know where something is, but you don't know what it is, right? In dowsing, you know what it is, but you don't know where it is. And so the the stereotypical thing is the the old prospector out in the desert with a forked stick trying to find water, right? You know, you walk along and and the stick indicates where there's water to dig, right? Well, it, it can be used in a lot more sophisticated ways than that. And and we did it at Fort Meade, trying to locate, like, uh, kidnap victims in, in, you know, Hezbollah kidnapped a bunch of folks in the Bekaa Valley in, in Lebanon, you know, and hid them there. We used dowsing to try and find them. We used dowsing to try and find, when we were doing the war on drugs part of the program, uh, trying to find narco uh, traffickers and, and drug shipments and stuff, and, and it worked out pretty well. So, so you use dowsing. Um, I don't. I, I occasionally have a call for it. I, I did. Uh, I, I might have mentioned this earlier. I can't remember. I did do a. Rem- yes, I did. I did a an archaeological remote viewing project for a, a company in France, and uh, one of the uh, requirements that I douse uh, uh, on a piece of paper, a map, map essentially, try and douse the location of an artifact and. Uh, I don't know whether that was successful or not. Oftentimes they don't tell you, but uh, but I did use it for that. But I have to tell you the one event, um, the, the fun one, right? The fun one. I don't know that I've told told that on your show before. But we were visiting some friends in Arizona when we were moving from Texas out to Utah, and we were there. And and the they lived in this big, like three or four story house. It's huge. They had three different storage rooms. One of them was really huge and. And the the lady of the house, you know, she was elderly. She was closing in on eighty, and she bought fourteen teddy bears for her grandchildren. And her <laughs> grandchildren. That's cute. And she put them in a box. And she had been looking for a year and a half, trying to find the box. She couldn't find it. And when I went around, I could see why, because there were like hundreds of boxes in that house, right? <laughs> it room. was there somewhere, right? It was there somewhere. So while she's telling my wife about all this stuff, I decide I'm going to try dows for the teddy bears, and I go down. And I'll make this short. Um, I first of all had to figure out using dowsing which was the proper room to to explore, and I I picked a room that felt like the right room, and I went in there, and then I walked around the room, and there were like five of these shelves that were about 20 feet long, double sided, so there were boxes on both sides of the shelves, and then around the perimeter of the shelves. I would say there was probably two or three hundred boxes in that room, you know, something like that. That's amazing. So. I'm walking around, and I'm, right, I'm, I'm doing my old dowsing thing, which is kind of an internal, kinesthetic, visceral kind of thing. And I hit a point where I didn't feel like I could go left or right. I was just kind of like, like when you hit the bottom of a, of a gully, either way is uphill, right? So I'm, I'm down here, and it feels like it's the resistance to go either direction. I'm thinking, why, don't I, why can't I move? And I kind of faced boxes, and there were three or four boxes there, and I just felt impelled to, to t- touch one, and I said, well, let me pull this, and I pull it out, and I open it up, and the 14 teddy bears were in there. So I go walking up the stairs, and she's still complaining to my wife about, I can't find those bears anywhere, and I went up, and I dumped them all in her lap, <laughs> and she goes, what? <laughs> That's fantastic. I love that. Do you love remote viewing? Well, I love talking about it, and when I first started doing it, I loved it. But, you know, it's really ironic. Uh, we at Fort Meade, after we'd done a 1,000 or two of these things, we, we, it got to be like any other job, you know? They yeah, say, got a little okay. mundane. Yeah, it, it, it says, well, it's time to go over and do another session. And we think, oh, crud, do I have to go over there and, and, and project my mind to the other side of the planet again? <laughs> you know, it was weird. One of my friends once said, you know what amazes me about this, Paul? I said, no, what? He says, it doesn't amaze me anymore. <laughs> Did you ever get headaches doing it? No. Uh-uh. Nothing like that. No. It's, it's you know, you get a little... I would say tired. It's more like you just kind of get get flaky. You get a little bit dingy after you've done it for a while, and and 
you just kind of like get into this other state of mind, which it is really another state of mind. Now, I, I need to go back and tell people, yes, it got to be it, it got to be like any other job, but still, every now and again, stuff happens that just surprises the heck out of me. And mostly, it's my students. They do stuff that I think that is so awesome. You know, they they just had a, a great success, and 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 so yes, it got to be like any other job. But it still wasn't like any other job. Have you come across a remote viewer student that was just exceptional, just blew yes. your mind? Yes. That has happened. Male, female? Both. Yes. And there's really no distinction there, is there? No. It, you know, people say, well, you know, women, they, they're they more in tune with their inner natures. They're more in tune with their intuition. So they've got to be better psychics. They've got to be better remote viewers. I don't find that to be true. I find that it doesn't have to do with gender. It has to do with, um, I would say, personality, character, uh, whatever. You know, it, it has to do with the, the, with you as a person. How about positivity? Uh, positivity plays a role. You have to be willing to give it a try, even if you know you might fail a few times, right? Uh, that's the thing is you have to let go of the need to succeed. You have to let go of the fear of failure. Right? Why does the military, Paul, seem to get out to these spots right after they happen? Right after they happen. <laughs> well, um, it depends, I think, on what the what the occurrence is, right? And and so there's plenty of of uh, UFO sightings and stuff. The military never shows up for it. Um, so right. But, but some things they do, and as they get reported, maybe you know an aircraft uh, crew member or whatever sees something, a pilot reports it, or 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 they may be observing. Because you have to recall the air, the the military in general, the air force in particular, and now the space force, they are are their job is to be vigilant, right, and keep an eye out for unusual things. So it's quite possible that a military observer spotted it and. And had people come out, you know, sent them out where they might have a good possibility of finding out information about whatever it is and researching it. Paul, have you ever met a young remote viewer like a kid? Really, kid? No, I'm probably the youngest I've met is 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 late teens. Okay, so so for little five year olds and such, they don't do this. Well, in principle, they could. Now, some people think that kids are are more capable of. Uh, of doing it than adults are, and and I think in a sense that they may be able to because they don't have as much to unlearn as adults do. Tend you know tend and they tend to not have the same kind of uh, defenses installed as an adult, so they might be more open to unusual experiences. The problem with kids, though, is that they also aren't very sophisticated thinkers, and so it may not occur to them what it is you're trying to get them to do. You know? Well, that's a good point. Yeah, I, it's, I, a, it's a challenge. They may have more ability, but more raw ability, but getting them to figure out what it is you want them to do with it could be a challenge. Good point indeed. Paul, thanks for being on the program. Always great talking to the remote viewer. His latest book, The Essential Guide to Remote Viewing, Paul Smith. You're listening to Coast to Coast AM. Connie Willis here. How are you? Hope you're doing okay tonight. Hope you're looking forward to a great show tonight. I'm going to say nothing but nice words about our guest for tonight, too, because he's he is a part of uh, all my shows. I'm a part of all his shows and all his classes and courses. He's been a friend for a long time. Every Everybody loves Lynn Buchanan. He's one of our favorite psychic spies, and he was a part of the Cold War, tells of his greatest adventure, adventures tonight. We're going to be asking him some questions and see if we can't pull something out of him that he's never told before. Hey, Lynn. Hey, how you doing? Thank you. And let me let me say just a little something about what you said when you were first introducing yourself. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh yeah. I've yeah. On, I've been on a lot of these shows, and uh, and for the most part. The host will have a list of questions, and they read them off, you know, and it's one by one. And it I don't know if you've been on this side of this interview process before, but it feels like I'm taking an exam. And you, George Norrie, uh, Art Bell, Jeffrey Mishlove, and, and a very few others, you you have a conversation. Yeah. And 
you have no idea what that means to the people you're interviewing. It's all the difference in the world. And I thank you for being here, uh, for being here. Thank you for inviting me. And, uh, yeah, Coast to Coast did right when they got you. I tell you. <laughs> oh, Lynn, I really appreciate that. That's that's a big deal coming from you. I really do appreciate that. Here's that 50 bucks. It's in the mail. Um, no, yeah. thank you so much. <laughs> Lynn. People have, have always said uh, psychics and all that will show me proof. These days, in this day and age, <laughs> they don't say that. They say, hey, show me your data. Ooh, that's a T-shirt and a bumper sticker in one right there. That's a oh, yeah. that's a little rubber bracelet around your wrist. Yeah. Wait a minute, what was that again? Show me your data. What was that? Show me your data. Yeah, and if if you want to look professional, you you have to have a database. Yeah, you have to have the data to to prove it. Yeah, when oh John Ronson uh, wrote. The Men Who Stare at Goats, he actually interviewed and researched everybody who had been in the unit, in both of the units, uh, Jim Channon's units and a unit in our unit, and in order to put it into a single story, he, he took bits and pieces, and so Lynn Cassidy in that movie yeah, is a com- is a compilation of me, Paul Smith, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, there's, Nick Monocle. There's even a little. There's even a little Ingo Swan in there. Oh, you gotta uh, have Ingo. Joe, yeah, Joe McMonagle, Mel Riley, and um, the you know the movie starts with you wouldn't believe how much of this is true. Well, I would say probably. Over 80% of the things that are shown in the movie actually did happen. But the storyline itself is a fake storyline that then encompasses what's happened over 18 to 25 years among all of the viewers who were in the unit. And so, um, so yeah... Uh, Lynn Cassidy is, there are many things in there that, that were me, my experiences. There were other so, things in there, part of Lynn Cassidy, that were somebody else's experience. He's a compilation. So he is a compilation. So everybody can say that. And, and so Lynn, Lynn Cassidy was the George Clooney. George yeah. Clooney was yeah. the Lynn Cassidy. Okay. All right. So did they spell it L-Y-N? Yeah, they did. Uh, so they actually used your name. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I think you, you have a lot of rights in, in talking about that one. Well, well who was, crazy, but they did. <laughs> well, you know, Hollywood, you never know what's going to happen there. Oh, so yeah. um, <laughs> we can talk about that for hours. So let me um, – um, who was our other buddy that was there that um, – uh, Shannon. Shannon. Oh, Jim Shannon, yeah. Uh, Jim yeah, Shannon, he helped. Uh, he, he died a few years ago. Yeah. I know, man. I learned about that later. What a, what an interesting guy he was, and Kentucky boy oh, yeah. too, by the way. So he was really neat, neat guy, creative, and I guess he helped on the set, right? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, he was a consultant actually, with this. They actually set. filmed out here about fifteen miles from where I was, but. Uh, they didn't let anybody in town know that they were out there filming. They didn't even of course. let the city council here know oh. that they were out there filming. <laughs> that might be illegal. Let me. What did Jim do for you guys, though, in real life, Jim Shannon? Uh, our two units were not officially connected. Uh, I think there were some crossovers at different points. But um, I know one time uh, <clears throat> I was in the unit, I got a letter, and it was uh, from Jim's unit. And I hadn't heard of Jim. I, I hadn't been there that, all that long. I hadn't heard of Jim all that, you know, before. And it was a thing saying, um, you've been invited to, to uh, uh, join a voluntary assignment to Delta Unit which was the actual name of the 
first uh, first Earth Battalion, and uh, and I saw Delta unit. I thought, hey, I ain't getting out and wallowing in mud and fighting snakes, you know. <laughs> doing that. So I, I just ripped the letter up, and I had no idea that it was it was from Jim inviting me to the unit, you know. Oh wow. Okay, Ingo Swan, the father of remote viewing. Uh, if you can give a little bit of background on him, but also tell me, tell all of us your relationship with Ingo. He was a interesting guy, obviously. And uh, I remember at one point when I was taking one of your classes, I remember, you know, this. You guys, I'm, I'm going to tell some secrets on you, Lynn. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you you better stop me from afar before I do anything because he can do that, you guys. Um, so. You know, Lynn is Lynn doesn't like being on the phone. He does not like being on the phone. And he his mind is very strong and he can zap computers and phones and everything else out. You don't want him touching your electronics, okay? Do not. He will not go with Apple because he's gotta he's gotta go with cheaper stuff because he blows them out all the time. That's what you told me once before. But That's true, um yeah. <laughs> but but um there was, you know, if you call him and you, you know, if he lets you have his number, it's it's tight, man. It's a tight thing, and I appreciate having that. But when it rings, he'll go and he'll listen to that, you know, 1920 answering machine that he might have. But <laughs> I'm just kidding you. The close. But, but he'll listen to who it is. And there was a time when we were there in class, and Ingo called, and your phone rang, and you were like, I'm not getting it. And then you heard his voice and you ran over and grabbed it. So yeah. basically the only person that could interrupt the, the class would be Ingo. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So yeah. tell us and, about Ingo and your relationship. Ingo and I were friends. Uh, when I first got to the unit, they needed somebody. Well, Ingo had lost his contract with uh, SRI. Uh, How? Institute. How? And, um, How did he lose it? He was great. Uh, anytime you ask any question in the D.C. area, you know, or in government, there are only two answers, and they are money and politics. Yeah, and, I uh, got you. Yeah. And so, um, anyway, uh, Brian, the director, and I uh, went up to New York to get the military's equipment from Ingo's you know, and goes uh, set up up there, and uh, and so <clears throat> I met Ingo for the first time, and uh, I don't think he, Ingo wasn't originally from Texas, but he must have must have had some kind of Texan blood in him because we started just slagging each other immediately and became good friends. After, do you know what that means? No, I was gonna. I thought, do I play this off and act like I do, or do I say, "What are you talking about?" Flagging uh, is friendly, insulting for each other, and uh, huh? uh, you know, there's there's an old saying that if you fall down, a friend will come up and say, "Are you all right?" A good friend will come up and say, uh, "Here, let me help you up," and they'll help you up. Your best friend is going to come up and say, what's the matter, stupid? Forget how to walk. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and that's uh, – Ingo and I just started insulting each other and laughing about it and just <laughs> became friends just right there, you know. And, uh, uh, and it stayed that way. A lot of people had met Ingo and said that he was gruff and, you know, just – Frank and, and would say rude things to you and all that. Ingo was one of the nicest guys. He just, like I say, he just had some Texan in him or something. I don't know. <laughs> but that was Ingo. When when he was rude to you, <laughs> he liked it was, you. It was because he liked you. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, I've got I've got one memory of him where I went to New York and um you know everybody said if you ever go to New York, you know, go you might be able to see Ingo. He'll be yeah. sitting out in front of his place on his stairs yeah. 
And if you yeah. walk by and see him, yeah, you get a chance to talk to him, right? Well, he wasn't, and I knocked, but before I did, I called you, and you're like, get, yeah. get some, get a bottle of wine, some grapes, and cheese. <laughs> I was like, okay. Yeah. Brie cheese. He loved brie cheese. Yeah. He yelled at me. He was like, who is this at my door? He yelled at me, and I was like, I felt like I was two inches tall, and when I left there, I left the bag of stuff, and I thought, well, there's my, there's my, there's my uh, time with Ingo Swan that I can tell everybody for the rest of my life, but at least I had that interaction with him before he passed away. Yeah. Uh, people often ask who's a better viewer, and, you know, like I was saying a while ago, uh, I am at a certain accuracy rate on colors, a different accuracy rate on sizes, shapes, relationships, uh, temperatures, things like that. So who's going to be the better viewer for what project? Oh, that, that's so good. You threw it back at me. That was good. Yeah. And, well played. You know, well played. You know, and the thing is, Joe... Well, both Joe and Ingo were natural psychics. Uh, mm. Joe learned the Ingo structure mainly because the military wants uh, uniformity in reporting and uniformity in work. And so uh, Joe learned that. Joe didn't need it. Uh, Joe never needed the Ingo Swan structure. He was he's one of the best psychics I've ever met. Um, Ingo, I never saw him do natural psychic work. I know he was a natural psychic, but all he ever did was the structured work. Uh, and so uh, so I really couldn't say who was a better psychic. I don't know. Uh, or or viewer, I'm, but you're talking about the two top ones. I'll tell you that. You know? Right. Okay. Okay. Well, you're up there too. So let me ask this. Okay. So when you teach the structure, okay. First of all, that's what Ingo did, right? He he created the structure so he could teach it to people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Okay. Okay, so now you teach people like me, you've taught me, you still teach people now, and you use the structure, you use the actual military structure, so, and you do it too, I've seen you do it maybe three times in the entire time I've known you, and it blows <laughs> me away when I've gotten to watch you. I can't believe what, you know, you guys, what happens is in the class, uh, if you take his class, and this was when we could go to his place. Now he does it online. But when Lynn does a class, or even Lori, and, and got to mention Lori at one point. But yeah. But so what happens is, you know, basically there's a picture. Without going into everything, um, there's a picture that's hidden, and we've picked it blindly out of a hundred envelopes, and you know, up, you know, number thirty three from the top, and that kind of thing. So, so there's a, a picture or a set of pictures. He's so advanced he gets a set of pictures that somebody put in that envelope you know who knows when and there's this collage of pictures and and information of whatever it is we're looking at and and Lynn starts looking you know starts doing the target and following the structure and and you know like if you're a student like me I was when I was taking his courses you know we would pass the pictures around and when I got the pictures and I was seeing what he was doing I was just like my jaw dropped I'm like there's no way this guy is drawing exactly the pictures as they are I could Lynn I couldn't believe it I thought no this is projected somewhere on the walls or the ceilings you were that unbelievable I'm thinking of two in my mind right now one of them was believe it or not it was like a group of nuns ice skating somewhere in an outdoor ice skating rink <laughs> yeah that was a that was a fun target when i you remember, you got <laughs> they you were having you started, so much fun i tell you yes and you were like okay there's a religious intent and you know of going on and you you actually drew the lines of the where the blades cut the ice on yeah. the rink it was unreal. So it was amazing to watch you do stuff. So when you when people ask you, because he doesn't like doing on mute, you guys, he calls it a dog and pony show. But Lynn, when you do it, people only want to see it because they don't want to see you fail. They want to see you do it. It's, it's remarkable. Yeah, yeah. 
and and I do feel, you know, sometimes, oh, well. I, sometimes I do real dog meat sessions. Yeah, you know, when you said only two <laughs> or three times, I I was thinking that what you were talking about. There have been several times when, uh, you know, I'm teaching along, and I'll start doing the session to show them how how the um, structure is and how you use the structure, and I'll say okay, uh, and I'll start working the target. And I'll finish it, and I'll turn around to the class and say, okay, how did I do? And they look at me with kind of blank stares, and they, we don't know. And it's because we forgot to pick a target beforehand. Oh. So I will pick up the envelope, <laughs> hand it to somebody in class, and say, pick a target. And, you know, out of that whole stack, pick a target. And they will randomly pick a target, and it will have been the one I viewed. Well, you know, when you actually think about it, uh, everybody says time is the fourth dimension, and that's not true. Um, time is an integral part of space, of the space-time continuum. And so uh, the measure of space is three dimensions when in actual fact it's it's space is like a big blob you know all of existence is like a big blob and since time is a part of space time is also that same big blob so when you move in time you move in space when you move in space you move in time and uh, um you know, it's it's just an integral part. It's all, it's not three or four separate dimensions. It's all one big blob. You know, hmm. you, you can move around in it any way you want. Yeah. Tell us about Lori and your relationship with her. Uh, Lori is uh, one of the uh, people who took the Inga Swan training. Uh, she took it from me. And uh, she really got into it and has delved into it and has become an excellent viewer and also an excellent teacher. Uh, she's yeah. taken the, training, the CRV training course, and, um, and she is an excellent teacher. She lives about, I guess, about 60 miles north of me here, and um, she's, like I am, just way out in the desert, you know. And, uh, uh, Just way out? <laughs> way out, yeah. And, I'm with uh, you. Oh, <laughs> uh, You know, she she does really good work. Uh, she does a lot of free work. Uh, she does a lot of free work over the Internet. And uh, uh, she's just, man, I wish I had one-tenth of her energy. She's just <laughs> constantly... Uh, going and doing and bubbly and, 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 uh, you know, I sit around here sometimes being, being my age and (laughs) (laughs) here's another thing about the controlled remote viewing that Ingo created. He created a methodology and a terminology. And, um, so you go to, any psychic for training, they're going to teach you their terms, their beliefs, their their whole cosmology and everything else. And you go to one qualified CRV trainer and take one course. You go to another one to take the next course. It's going to pick up with the same terminology, same structure, everything as the other teacher where the other teacher left off, and um, and so it's a it's a uh, method that is um, basically kind of standardized. You know, uh, it's still growing, of course, but um, but you're not limited to one teacher and one teacher's cosmology and one teacher's belief system and all that. Uh, you know, you can have any belief system you want, and the structure of the Ingo Swan method will help you control that ability 
This is why it's called controlled remote viewing. Uh, uh, we say we're a controlled remote viewer, but we're not. Uh, the thing is, we're a viewer who is in control of their viewing. And uh, and the thing is, you know, there's a growing body of people who are all using the same method, the same reporting method, and uh, it's a reporting method that works for police departments, for um, research scientists, for the three-letter organizations in the government, for you know, for uh, businesses, corporations, and all that. They love it. It's a professional method that is standardized that everybody gets. Yeah. Well, now you um, and Lori as well, and you all even work together all the time. But you've got these courses now online. It's you all. It's so much <laughs> simpler than back in the day with me, because um, we had to get out there, <laughs> right? It was tough, yeah. but it was fun. Yeah. Like we got and, to hang out know, in your house. Not only not only the cost and the trouble for getting here. Uh, most people paid more for the travel and the lodging than they paid for the course. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> also, we only had three days, and uh, the courses I have, like the um, the basic course, has over 160 different video lessons. I know. I can't believe it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and you know there is wow. no way I could have packed that into three days' of time. It just couldn't be done. And so now, then, I'm actually. You know, having people go through the course, I have a a webinar with them on the weekends, and uh, and I get the time with the students. They have more information and more study than they ever could when they were just coming here to the house. And uh, I wish I I wish I'd done this online for years. But I don't think you were able to though at that point. I don't know that the technology. It would have been tough. It would have been tough, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, that may not have stopped you. But, you know, it was great being able to go to your house. Um, you had a, you have a, an incredible home. Um, uh, you, you know, like Linda would hide out somewhere. We yeah. rarely saw her or your mom. Uh, I wa- always loved your kitchen because it's got this huge griddle, you know, this yeah. restaurant kitchen that you have. <laughs> yeah. And you had your pool back there and you, you had the dogs and it was fun. It was very homey and, and just a very nice place and atmosphere. You know, one of the things I remember you talking about that was you had said um, that they had, uh, I guess, you had viewed somebody a minute after they passed. And yeah. then they would move you to two minutes, two weeks, two months, whatever. Sometimes you saw nothing until about 13, 12 or 13. Do you remember those, that? Those, those are reincarnated. Hmm. Uh, those always seem to reincarnate into a 12 or 13-year-old kid, not into hmm. a uh, the ones that were given to me. Uh, they... None of those reincarnated into a baby. And I just always wondered if that's where the all the different cultures have realized that, you know, the coming of age ceremony and all that. I just always wondered if uh, there was a whole lot more to that than just meets the eye, you know, if, if maybe the... In ancient cultures, they knew that at that age, for some for some kids, uh, all of a sudden the spirit just reincarnates into them. That's that's interesting. I think you're right. There always seems to be something, some some sort of truth to to the things along the way in life. And I guess yeah. along the way, we've forgotten what the roots are. Um, yeah. So describe what you felt was was heaven uh it was it was just amazing i would i would you know get to that person at that point and uh and 
it was just indescribably beautiful and wonderful. And uh, I know for a lot of those targets, I would I would just feel and, and I, would, I would feel wonderful for a week after the session. Um, for the ones that went to what I would call hell, uh, usually uh, they would give me, you know, the move forward into time. And within like a tenth of a second, I would just, uh, uh, just be kicked out of the session completely and just have, on some of them, I'd have nightmares for, for a week afterwards. Uh, Ooh. I mean, really, really horrible. And uh, uh, so, what did you see? What did you see? Mainly a blackness, but it was a blackness that was so absolutely scary and just, just. Uh, after you've experienced this, it, it's hard to describe. Uh, you know, it, it told me one thing. Uh, I don't want to go that way when I die. <laughs> right, right. So can you try to put into words the heaven? I'm going to try to dig in deep there. I just want to get that visual if I can yeah. from you. Oh, yeah, it was, it was light. It was wonderful. Uh, there were people there who were happy and friendly, and uh, uh, you know, I would, of course, I would be describing this and writing it down on paper the whole time. So, this is not one of those where I uh, bilocated or had the perfect site integration. But um, you might not have but, come back if you did that. <laughs> I don't think I would have wanted to, no. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know uh, those feelings that you can get when you're doing those targets and you would, you know, bilocate and do some neat things. You had told a story one time that I thought was amazing. So it was probably the first time that I was around you. You would just blow us away with with stories and I would I know I, I know I don't know what you remember of me in class but I would just look at you and I'd have another question and another question and another question. <laughs> <laughs> I could I I just had to know more but you had mentioned at one point where I I don't know who it was or anything but I remember you guys had realized at one point I guess as uh maybe Ingo as well but you had realized that you could go in and view something for the military and you could be in that situation trying to get information. And then you started noticing that the people that were there in that situation, usually they couldn't see you. But at one point you saw that some people could see you. What was well, that about? Okay. Um, yeah. One of the, reasons that uh, uh, the controlled remote viewing is uh, what was so uh, favored was the fact that you can't get caught. And so uh, you can't get noticed if you're doing it correctly. And so, uh, you know, let's say you're spying on some classified facility over in another country, and they have guards walking around the perimeter with guard dogs and all that. And all of a sudden, the guard dog alerts. Well, other countries take this very seriously, and they're going to report that. And then the next day, it gets reported, and people get together who are leading some secret project, and they say, oops, maybe we'd go to, better go to Plan B. But with CRV... You can't get caught. The dog won't alert, and uh, and so the information you get on Plan A, they stick with Plan A because they don't know they've been spied on, and uh, and so the information remains good. And uh, so one of the big features about CRV is you don't get caught. Well, 
there are ET bases on the Earth, and uh, we were never officially, let me underscore the word officially, we were never officially tasked to view them. However, we did and, and, you know, counted them as practice sessions and all that. And uh, so one of the uh, AT bases especially, uh, Pat Price, one of the early, early people, had viewed this and had been caught by the aliens there. It scared him. He never viewed it again. He refused to view it again. And it was given to me. I didn't know, you know, it just, there was another targeting in an envelope. And uh, I got to that ET base, and the ETs there just basically came up. They said, look, we know you're here, and it's okay. Look around. See what you want. We're not hiding anything. And so I did. And uh, come to find out, uh, uh, I we kind of got feedback, and uh, you know, it was it was accurate. Yeah. So okay, did you buy locate on that one? Yeah, I did. That was one of those where I had perfect site integration and uh, uh, mentally. Okay, stress that mentally. Uh, yeah, I was I was standing there. It was the one in the uh, uh, mountains down in northern Australia, and uh, I was standing there and uh, watching these these uh, ships come in and passengers unloading and loading and all that. The uh, ET base in uh, Australia seems to be the one that is uh, the sort of port of entry for friendly ETs and uh, they come in and they land there first and then go out around the world. Uh, there's uh, there's another base like that, I think, on the moon. But uh, I know this, for a lot of people, this sounded crazy. No, we're with you. But, uh, yeah, the... Uh, were they the friendly ones? Uh, you said they were friendly, but were yeah, they the they were, psychic they were ones? The, they were friendly ones, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. They the friendly and, psychic uh, or friendly non-psychic? Oh, uh, well, obviously the psychic ones, yeah, because they, they picked up on me that I was there, huh. you know. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and they let me know. Yeah, it's okay. You're, what, you're here, so what? Yeah. What are, were they the grays, tall grays? Oh, what 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 did they look like? These, these weren't. Uh, they were they were different. They were more humanoid. Yeah. <laughs> are you are you blowing this off because you can't say? Or are you going to tell me? You got to give me a description, or can you not? Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, you, you told too much, or? Well, yes, yeah, told too much, but. Um, <laughs> the base, there are also humans working there. So, you know. And were they actual humans or were they more like. No, they I were, mean, did they, they were, ever live they, like an earthling? Yeah, there were actual humans working there, but uh, there are oh. also uh, many different species were coming in and, and leaving. Yeah. So that was that that was like maybe someone that was born in Chicago and now they're working on the base with the aliens. Well, um that kind of thing. This this goes into a long thing. I don't know if we've got time for this, but Yeah, um, yeah. When the what's being called the Anunnaki left, you know, uh after being here and mining gold and they, and they left they took humans with them, mm. and uh, those humans have been on other planets working there, and many as you know, just uh, service people. And uh, now um, there are those who are escaping and coming back 
you know, and trying to blend in with the human population, not as spies for them, but simply because they want their freedom. They don't want to come in and they don't want to have any political power. They don't want to have anything else. They just want the little white cottage with a picket fence around it and, you know, four kids and a dog and and to live out their life here just happy as they can be. And that's all they want. They, just- they want to come back home. If you want to listen to our show ad-free, 24-7, access audio archives, live chat with me, and much more, you need to become a Coast Insider now. So you're telling me your grandmother, who died a few weeks ago, came and visited you last night in your bedroom, and you're not scared? Are extraterrestrials living among us? I don't know if it's true or not, folks, but we're going to find out. If you enjoy stories like these and want to learn more about the mysteries of the universe with me, become a Coast Insider now to access hundreds of our archived shows to listen anytime, anywhere. Sign up now at coasttocoastam.com slash coastinsider. That's coasttocoastam.com slash coastinsider.